From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Joe Matthew, I'm Kaylee Lines. The Federal Reserve dials back its forecast to just one interest rate cut this year, only hours after monthly CPI data show cooling inflation. We'll have details from Washington and insights from Jared Bernstein, chair of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. President Biden just landing in Italy for a meeting of the G7 nations. We'll discuss his agenda with Congresswoman Haley Stevens of Michigan and also ask her about what just happened on the House floor. Republicans voting to hold Attorney General Merrick Garland in contempt of Congress. And our conversation this hour with Steve Ballmer, the former Microsoft CEO, joins us on artificial intelligence and his mission to counter misinformation with something called USA Facts. Thanks for joining us on Bloomberg TV and radio following the unanimous decision from the FOMC to not change interest rates. Fed Chair Jay Powell had this to say when asked why Americans are unhappy with the economy. I don't think anyone knows uh, has a definitive answer why um, people are, are not as happy at, at, about the economy as they might be. And we don't tell people how they should think or feel about the economy. That's not our job. We, you know, we're, people experience what they experience. All I can tell you is what, what the data show, which is we've got an economy that's growing at a solid pace. Joining us now, Jared Bernstein, chair of the White House Council of Economic Advisors from the North Lawn of the White House. Jared, welcome back. It's good to see you on the program. I don't know if this is celebration day at the White House. I see the statement from the president says prices are still too high. But to what extent are you allowed to acknowledge the ground that's been covered here, the progress that's been made? Well, both uh, things are true. Uh, You heard uh, Chair Powell uh, talk about the strength of the economy, but I think uh, we've been out here long enough, Yumi and Kaylee, talking about exactly that. We know we have a a job market with an unemployment rate that's been 4% or below for two and a half years, and we know that prices are too high. The question is, what kind of progress are we making? And we, when we get a month of May with 272,000 jobs, which is the last time I was out here talking to you two, and then followed by an inflation report that was zero for the month, uh, you know, obviously that's progress on the right track. We have to continue aggressively pushing down costs where we can, health care, child care, housing, junk fees, while doing all we can to maintain the tightness of the labor market. We are making pro- progress moving in the right direction, not there yet. Well, Jared, one of the areas where we're still seeing stickiness is shelter. This is actually something Mm -hmm. that Chairman Powell was asked about in the press conference today, this idea that higher interest rates potentially are exacerbating the problem in housing. What the chairman said is that the best thing the Fed can do is bring down inflation so it can bring down rates. But if you listen to Democrats like Senator Elizabeth Warren, they think actually it's higher interest rates that are exacerbating the problem and making it more difficult to get inflation down. Which one is it? in your economic mind? Well, in my economic mind, when it comes to housing, uh, the two words that we should all have top of mind are supply shortage. We have a supply shortfall in this economy that has nothing to do with the latest Fed cycle. It's 10 years, at least a decade in the making. Now, this president has a plan to add 2 million units of affordable housing. We've also uh, provided pretty extensive rent assistance to folks uh, already, both through the uh, American Rescue Plan and beyond. So we're actively trying to help expand the uh, supply of affordable housing. But boy, do we need Congress to work with us on that one. And there's no way that should be a red, blue or purple issue. Uh, This is an issue. This this supply shortfall in affordable housing is uh, active in, in, in states across the land. So we have a great plan to do something about it. We need Congress's cooperation. I want to go back to that comment from, from Chairman Powell. I don't think anyone has a definitive answer. He said why people are not as happy about the economy as they might be. And he said it's not his job to find out. But it's kind of your job, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. And I wonder how you feel about that after a report like this that brought a lot of good news today. Yeah, I kind of agree with you. I kind of think it is my job. Uh, and that's because it's uh, President Biden uh, really uh, views it as essential to know not just how the economy is doing, but how people are experiencing that. And I thought Chair Powell was uh, spot on when he said, 
You know, we're not telling anybody how they should think or feel about the economy. They're the best arbiters of their own situation. One of the things that, you know, I've zeroed in on, and I think we've talked about this before, is not just inflation, it's the price level. People still remember what things used to cost. Mm -hmm. And look, in some areas, we do have costs coming down. You know, the price of gas this morning was 14 cents lower than it was a year ago. I think that's a very positive development, especially when you attach that onto the fact that wages for middle wage workers are up a buck 20 over a year ago. So those both work in the right uh, direction. Grocery prices, so salient in this conversation about how people feel about the economy. Here's the last four months of grocery prices. 0%, 0%, negative 0 0.2, 0%. Uh, that's a great track record that's going to help. But uh, the, price, the price level, prices are still too high, is a phrase you hear this president say. You mentioned it in a statement yeah. this morning every time he talks about this. So, Jared, if it is partially your job to understand how people are feeling about the economy, and I know it's not your job to give us an opinion on the level of interest rates, but what kind of economy will you be assessing? How will people be feeling if the level of interest rates is maintained at this level, at least until December? How much worse could people feel by then? Well, I think the key thing there is to just think about the, the real variables that matter most to people. Jobs wages, incomes, okay? So the interest rate is hanging out there uh, and it is obviously highly influential. We talked about its role in the housing sector a minute ago and I agree with you, there's amb ambiguity there. But at the end of the day, uh, when we have an unemployment rate that is uh, as low as this one's been, when we keep adding jobs at a clip that means uh, really robust earnings opportunities for people and probably most important, paychecks beating prices, okay? For 15 months in a row, one five, and we wrote about this this morning, you can see it on the CEA blog, for 15 months in a row, yearly uh, pay has grown faster. Yearly hourly wages has outpaced prices. This is for middle wage workers. If you look at middle wage workers over the past year, their pay is up 4.2%. We know this morning, inflation 3.3%. We've seen that pattern now uh, for, as I said, 15 months running. If you look at disposable income adjusting for inflation, it's up $3,700 relative to pre-pandemic. So one of the things that we've been trying to bring to the discussion is we have to pay a tremendous amount of attention to not just inflation, but the price level, continue working to bring down costs. We also have to look at the other side of the ledger, how wages and incomes are growing. All right, Jared Bernstein, the chair of the White House Council of Economic Advisors, joining us from the White House North Lawn this evening. Thank you so much. Now joining us back in studio after being present in the room with Chairman Powell at that uh, Fed News conference earlier today is Bloomberg's Michael McKee. So, Mike, obviously the takeaway from today was that they held rates steady. They also see fewer rate cuts coming this year. But it does feel like it's almost going to be a coin flip as to its, whether it's one cut or two. And I wonder how the timing of a presidential election may ultimately influence that. I don't think it will influence it. Uh, the Fed has been very clear about not being affected by politics. And history shows they're not. Uh, what it is, uh, what, what, what is confusing is the fact that four people wanted uh, no cuts, seven wanted one cut, and eight wanted two cuts. So they're very divided over this. I think the bottom line is they don't know what they're going to do. And then when we asked, how are you going to know, Jay Powell said, we can't tell you that. <laughs> and they're forecasting inflation is going to go up, but they're Cutting rates, I mean, it, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So it's just going to be a fly by the seat of your pants, see what the data say. We have a meeting. What do we think? Uh, that's the way it's going to work. So September could be in play. You're one of the few Americans who gets locked in a room with Jay Powell and allowed to ask him questions following these Fed meetings. And you've been there for the cycle. How has his demeanor evolved? Which Jay Powell did you get today? Oh, I thought we got a, a fairly relaxed Jay Powell. Um, the questions were a bit sharp in the sense that some of their forecasts, as I mentioned on inflation, didn't necessarily jibe with the way the Fed should be operating or you think the Fed should be operating. But he clearly rehearsed those. He knew the answers. He knew those questions would be asked. So he knew what he was going to say. Great to have you in Washington. As always, Bloomberg's Michael McKee, straight from the Fed to our desk here at Balance of Power. And joining us now is Bloomberg Opinions' Nia Malika Henderson. Uh, with our eyes here, uh, Nia, on something fascinating that just, just continues to dog this president, and that is the stubborn level of inflation. When you look at 
On a good news day, the statement that we just mentioned from Jared Bernstein, though, it's fascinating. Prices are still too high. Are they finally getting the rhetoric right? Yeah, I, I think that's right. They're, they're meeting people where they live and how average people are experiencing uh, the economy. Average people don't experience, w- with all of this data uh, and, mm. the, and the numbers, they experience it in how many bags of groceries can mm. they get when they go to the Piggly Wiggly or the Winn-Dixie or the Farmer Jack or whatever uh, local grocery store you go to. They know that the price of cereal is higher now than it was uh, before, a dozen eggs or a gallon of milk. And so you now see an evolution Evolution from sort of Bidenomics, right, and sort of trumpeting the idea that the economy is good and really trying to uh, tackle the real problem and the real ways that Americans experience the economy. And listen, they've got a couple of months. Uh, you know, the data seems to be going in, in a good place, but there is a locked in feeling among average Americans that the Trump economy was better than the Biden economy. Obviously, the economy is only one of a number of issues that this president is dealing with. Some of those issues, as we have seen on full display this week, are within his own family Mm -hmm. after the conviction of his son, Hunter Biden. You have a new opinion piece out on the Bloomberg today. You say Biden sets an example after that conviction. And you write in part, this difficult time for Biden's family is also proof of his core goodness. You go on to say millions of Americans struggle with their own addictions and those of family members. Biden's struggle is their struggle. For all of our conversation, Nia, about how this might damage him politically, is it actually proving to make him a more sympathetic character in the eyes of voters? I I think that's exactly right. It reminds voters of why they liked Biden in the first place, and particularly those voters that have soured on Trump. A lot of those folks who switched from Trump to Biden uh, in 2020 had character questions about uh, Donald Trump, and now you see the juxtaposition between how Biden has handled the conviction of his son and how Trump handled it, right? Trump is uh, bitter. He's vowing revenge if he gets back into the White House, and You see Biden embracing his son uh, and embracing and having faith in the Justice Department, too, uh, not assailing the verdict at all. And so it was a real, I think, moment, I think, for a lot of Americans to see the difference between these two uh, men who are vying for the presidency. All right. Bloomberg Opinions, Nia Malika Henderson, thank you so much. And on that subject of confidence in the Justice Department coming up, we'll have more on Attorney General Merrick Garland just being held in contempt of Congress in a vote on the House floor moments ago. Congresswoman Haley Stevens, the Democrat from Michigan, will join us next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. On this vote, the yeas are 216, the nays are 207. The resolution is adopted. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. House Republicans just voting there to hold Attorney General Merrick Garland in contempt of Congress, referring him to his own department for prosecution. Joining us now is Congresswoman Haley Stevens, the Democrat from Michigan and the co-chair of the Congressional Hostage Caucus. Congresswoman, obviously this just happened in your chamber. What kind of precedent does this set for other attorneys general, other cabinet officials, period, and Congress moving forward? Well, I was on the floor of the House and I was talking with a colleague of mine on the Democratic side who was in the hearings watching just the outward stark persecution of Merrick Garland, a true public servant, as a reminder, someone who was uh, nominated to go onto the Supreme Court, was deprived of that by Mitch McConnell, who's now stepped up to be our attorney general, who in that hearing process reminded us of some of the great work that he's doing, the implementation of the bipartisan gun safety legislation that we pushed forward a couple of years ago, and it is Gun Violence uh, Prevention Month. And this is just tragic. You're right. It's setting a bizarre and unfortunate precedent. And it's certainly symbolic of what the GOP uh, in this very tight minority has been up to, which is a whole lot of nothing. I mean, the American people are ready for us to deliver on the economy, ready for us to accelerate efforts as we're competing on the global stage uh, against the Chinese Communist Party, propelling our auto industry forward. Let's get serious here. And yet it's just constant partisan gains with no end. This isn't going to be taken up in the Senate. We should be getting to work. 
Congresswoman, I want to ask you from your perch as co-chair of the Congressional Hostage Caucus what you're hearing about a possible ceasefire in Israel. This is something that we've uh, been talking about now for many months, and I know you're frequently the first to hear information. We just saw four Israeli hostages uh, rescued in an IDF raid that claimed the lives, according uh, to uh, Hamas officials, more than 250 Palestinians. At what point are we going to be talking about uh, a release and not a rescue? Right. And we need to see a release happen because those rescues are enormously costly uh, for the IDF and obviously for innocent civilians in Gaza. And we were overwhelmed and elated to see these four incredible individuals returned uh, to their homeland. And we need, we need to see the rest of the hostages returned. Uh, just last week, I held a press conference alongside families whose loved ones are continuing to be held hostage. It is incredibly painful. And the reminder is that these hostages are the heartbeat of the negotiation. These were innocent civilians, uh, by and large, going about their everyday life. They were at a music con concert. They were sleeping in their home. They were attacked. They were taken. And this is an equal state actors. When I deal with hostage and wrongful detainee issues, oftentimes, we have diplomacy. We have ability to dialogue. I've spoken to all of you before on the show about Paul Whelan, my constituent, uh, a Michigander who's been wrongfully detained in Russia for over five years. Mr. Whelan has counselor access. It's no picnic, but at least there's diplomacy, and he's in Russia. What's happened with the hostages of 24 nationalities over in Gaza is they are just taken and they are not heard from. And then we get every, yeah. every once in a while a, a, a video that's, you know, coming out and the like. Congresswoman, the President Biden just landed in Italy for the G7. And obviously Ukraine is going to be front of mind, but Israel is there as well. What what would you most like to see the president accomplish with this meeting? Well, look, we've got, in, in terms of what the, the president is focused on and, and doing, uh, it's it's hugely important. Uh, we've got Mr. Blinken over uh, in the Middle East right now, bringing forward the over dozen nations, trying to reach a ceasefire deal. We want to see a ceasefire happen. Hamas has come back after they've admitted that Palestinian deaths are helping their cause in terms of winning this war with Israel, which is abhorrent and wrong and why why Israel must succeed because humanity must succeed. Uh, we know that they've come back with some nego negotiation adjustments, some that Mr. Blinken have said are acceptable and some that are not. Uh, and we need to reach this deal. We need to see the hostages return. We need to see the fighting stop. We know that Hezbollah is continuing to attack in the north. And these, these matters uh, are something that I am watching as a lawmaker closely every day. We are waiting for updates, just as you asked. And then in terms of President Biden's leadership, this has just been enormous. He's on the heels of the uh, 80th anniversary trip to, to Normandy. He sat down with Zelensky there. You saw our World War II heroes, the the very few, you know, few who remain sitting down with him as well. Yeah. So this is a big day and a big moment for democracy. Well, we appreciate your time, as always, Congresswoman. Stay uh, in touch with us as you learn more about what's happening. Representative Haley Stevens, the Democrat from Michigan, thank you, as always, for being with us on Balance of Power. Coming up, we look ahead of the G7 summit with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern as President Biden touches down in Italy. This is Balance of Power, Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. The G7 summit is set to begin tomorrow as world leaders gather in Italy for the annual event. President Biden landed in the country just moments ago, and Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern is joining us live on the ground from there. So, Anne-Marie, now that Biden has arrived, what's item one on his agenda? 
Item one is going to be for sure to get over the finish line this idea of being able to tap into the interest payments that are going to be accruing over the next few years, or depending how long this war lasts, of those Russian assets that are currently immobilized. The frozen assets, about $300 billion worth, mostly notably, they're held here in Europe. What the United States want to do is to tap the future interest payments of these to total about $50 billion to be able to give you. Ukraine, this financial help at a dire moment that they need. This is where the negotiations have been very difficult. And you can imagine the negotiations have been made even more difficult given the European elections and the blow that the likes of Emmanuel Macron and Olaf Scholz have faced over the weekend as they head to the G7 in Puglia. But I've been told that a deal in principle has been reached. There are still just some of these technical details being worked out. But for President Biden, when he sits down with Volodymyr Zelensky tomorrow and then briefs the press, this is going to be a key deliverable that this administration wanted to see. So that'll be just in time. It sounds like then, Anne-Marie, for his bilateral news conference uh, with President Zelensky tomorrow. We'll, of course, all be listening. You'll be there. We'll have it live here on Bloomberg. What will Joe Biden's message be? His message is going to be one of strength and unity that he wants to project to the world and that he wants to project to Ukraine. Because as I mentioned, this is an interesting G7 in the fact that, one, it comes just ahead of the U.S. election for many European leaders, some of which, some of these countries are a little bit nervous about the potential of former President Donald Trump coming back. He has talked about potentially wanting the U.S. to leave NATO. Um, he has talked about being able, uh, you know, his commitments on Ukraine have been fraught at some moments when he speaks about the country there. So this is an important for G7 where President Biden wants to talk about the U.S.'s commitment to Ukraine. But what makes it also very difficult is at moments, this is not where the electorate is in Europe. What we saw is Euroskeptic nationalistic parties sweep across France and Germany. This is why this is going to be a very difficult G7. And more than anything, the standout is Georgia Maloney. This individual, it almost feels like European leaders are coming here for a new coronation of a new leader of Europe. Well, really glad that you're there, uh, Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie Hordern will be joining us live from Italy uh, throughout the day tomorrow. So get some rest. Buona sera. We'll have a lot more from here on Balance of Power. Coming up, our conversation with Steve Ballmer. The founder of USA Facts, of course, the former CEO of Microsoft, sits down with us in studio to discuss the future of AI and digital misinformation and his new project that is the counterbalance. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Microsoft investment in G42 further cements the, let's say, um, uh, ability for the UAE and our national champions to work with OpenAI. Another thing, Sam Altman in the World Government Summit in February, uh, I had the conversation with him and he said, I would love to have a sandbox where we were able to test new things uh, in a government environment where we can actually create controlled environments, but at the same time change policies and regulations quickly. That was Omar al Olama, the United Arab Emirates State Minister for AI and Digital Economy, speaking yesterday right here on Bloomberg TV and radio, talking about working with Microsoft on AI. And we're joined now by the former CEO of Microsoft, Steve Ballmer, who is also founder of USAFacts.org, an organization you've heard us talk about before, dedicated to pushing facts forward online to help to counter misinformation. Mr. Balmer, great to see you. Welcome back to Bloomberg. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So you, of course, started on this project before AI was every other line in every conversation and NVIDIA this and uh, super micro computer that. But are we framing this correctly now? Have you become the counterbalance or the antidote to AI-driven misinformation? I think about it a little bit different. I think two things are true. Number one, we had disinformation before we had AI. Fair enough. <laughs> and at least AI is not deliberate in its misinformation. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm saying anybody of, of any uh, is, but yeah, some people are. We have foreign influences certainly trying to provide us with misinformation. And number two, 
What we try to do is to make government data, government, uh, understandable by the numbers, mm. which is a little more than just get at the data in a nonpartisan way. We try to be comprehensive. Here's all the money government spends. Here's what they spend it on. Here's all the taxes. How, how are we doing in consumer product safety? Mm. It gets this much of your budget. This is what we pay for, and you know, product safety recalls, et cetera. So we just we want to explain, put things in a form where humans can digest it. We will use some AI. We are starting to use some AI in how we build our product mm. and assemble information so we can cover more topics than we could if we couple ever, everything up by hand. How about that? So what AI are you using? Is this chat GPT? Is it open AI? Do you have a preferred provider? Sure, Microsoft, uh, given <laughs> my former, more, former job. But remember, the way the open AI Microsoft relationship works uh, at the back end technology level, it's one platform. Mm. Uh, the open AI stuff is built on the Microsoft platform, delivered off of Microsoft Azure. So mm -hmm. it's, it, it's the same whether you procure through one company or the other. Uh, and then on the user interface side, again, there's a full collaboration. So whether you use the ChatGPT app or the Microsoft Copilot Co app, you get the same thing. But yes, they are my preferred vendor. Uh, as, as the, <laughs> sold by far my largest share, I think I'm still the largest shareholder in Microsoft. Yes. <laughs> the Microsoft well button. done, sir. Well played. But so the information in this hard copy, uh, this old fashioned hard copy that I'm holding, uh, could help to train AI, correct? Sure. Is it also going to help with inference on the way out? Yeah. The, the, there's, there's, there's three things. One, our, our data is up on the Internet, so it will be... Remember, we have no unique data in here, not one bit. We have our synthesis, but it's all government numbers about what's happened. We're not making up data. We're just packaging it. But, yes, mm -hmm. it'll be available. The, the LLMs will get trained on it. Yes. Number two... Um, we ourselves have done a bunch of prompt engineering to help us make sure that as we use AI to build our product, we are also ensuring the accuracy of the data through the AI processes. Mm -hmm. There's still got to be some hand intervention, but we need to do that. And then number three, a third step would be eventually uh, to actually do training on this specific set of data uh, which we could do, or even better yet, government could provide its data in a format which is simpler for LLMs to process, in which case, hey, we don't have to do that. Well, there's other things government can provide, not just data, but say laws, regulation, especially as we began this conversation talking about misinformation that could be propagated as we speak in the middle of an election cycle. How does all of this need to be regulated, and can we do it quickly enough? Yeah, I don't think regulation is our is our savior. I think innovation. So what is social media companies being better cops on the beat? Again, the technology will have to be really good for the people who run the platforms of all kinds to do a good job. I have been com convinced in my short day here in uh, in Washington that probably the right thing is to make sure the legislation is in place so that people who have been violated in some way, whether it's deep fakes or, you know, uh, child harassed through an AI, whatever, that they are clearly prosecutable. That, I think, we need legislation. I believe in that. Mm -hmm. Trying to regulate, I think it's premature. We don't know enough. And over time, government will have to build some center of expertise because you can't just say, let's regulate without really understanding what's going on in the technology. Is my, it my opinion. too late to stop the deep fake that could upset this election? There will be nothing that happens. I mean, there will be fakes that get taken down. But there will be nothing that, I think, fundamentally disrupts where we are mm -hmm. uh, that you can do in June for an election that's in no November. Mm -hmm. Speaking of that election. Obviously, we know it's going to be Trump versus Biden in November. What we don't know is who might be on the ticket with Donald Trump. And one of the contenders, at least to our understanding, is someone you know quite well, Doug Burgum. Hmm. Do you think he would make a, vi a good vice president? I can't say I know what makes a good vice president, <laughs> so I can't really comment. But yeah, I've known Doug since for, 
45 years since we worked on a school project together in business school. Wow. Um, so I've known him a, a long time. Do you plan to get involved in this campaign financially? Uh, no, I will not. You will not. not. Is there a reason for that? I run a nonpartisan organization. Obviously, I have my opinions on policy issues, and I vote, so you know that does happen. But it's not my role to to do that. There are others. I mean, you know, I have friends who will do, participate, and there's a lot of people who will do that. Um, I don't choose to get involved. My my wife will get involved some, but mm-hmm. I will not. This is a political show, which is why we're here talking about policy. But we also want to share our condolences on the passing of Jerry West. And I wonder what went through your mind when you heard this news today about the logo. Yeah, uh, you know, Jerry West has been a consultant to the Clippers, really, really to to me, but to our whole staff for the last seven years. And uh, getting to know Jerry has been one of the grand joys of my life. Uh, fun, loyal, competitive, smart, and not just about basketball. He was always reading biographies. You know, Winston Churchill said this or that. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm going to miss Jerry. I'm going to miss him a lot. I appreciate that. Well, we're sorry for your loss, and we appreciate you sharing your thoughts on his legacy. And we appreciate you joining us here in studio. It was great to have you, sir. Steve Ballmer, founder of USA Facts. Now still ahead on Balance of Power, President Biden has landed in Italy for the G7. What can we expect to see from him this week? Our political panel will join us next on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. President Biden has just landed in Italy to attend the G7 summit, where world leaders plan to discuss the war in Ukraine and the war between Israel and Hamas. Joining us now is our political panel, Pat Dennis, president at American Bridge 21st Century, and Maura Gillespie, founder and principal at Blue Stack Strategies. So, Pat, obviously this is one of the benefits of incumbency. Incumbency, when you're campaigning for re-election, you get to go do these big foreign trips and have all of the the merits of the presidency, if you will, uh, while doing so. How politically important is it for Biden uh, when he's doing things like holding a joint presser with Vladimir Zelensky in Italy tomorrow? Yeah. And look, something that's really important is the contrast with Donald Trump. When you saw Donald Trump go to these big meetings in the past, he would be fighting with people. He would be trying to, you know, divide people, causing chaos. Uh, And what you see really with um, with Biden is leadership, right? He's there with Zelensky. He's showing our friends, you, we are with you. We will stay with you. We will fight with you. And that's really important. The contrast, you know, reminding people what it was like, the chaos of the Trump administration is probably the most important political thing. Here. You know, Maura, he actually, the president apologized to, to Vladimir Zelensky last week in Normandy for the delay in uh, coming up with funding for Ukraine. And we all went through this in real time together for many months Uh, with a lot of Republicans in the House particularly pushing back on the idea of continuing to fund the war effort in Ukraine. This news conference they're going to hold tomorrow is almost the final answer to that six-month-long debate. What should be President Biden's posture when it comes to this, knowing Republican lawmakers are listening? It's going to be about reaffirming America's role in the world, but also as an ally. Where do we stand? Do we stand with our allies or do we hide, you know, behind... Uh, political, you know, misgivings about where the money is going and where it's being spent. You know, I think it's really important that he reaffirms to Zelensky, but signals to the world that we aren't just going to cower away. Uh, we will be there for our allies and support them, and they should do the same. Uh, I think talking to world leaders on this on this front is really important, especially for a pro democracy stance. And again, you know, we we talked about this as the president uh, went overseas for D Day. Um, it's really important to keep politics at the water's edge and focus on America's role. Um, And as our commander in chief, as the leader of the free world, that's what he should be doing. Well, Maura, we were just speaking with Anne-Marie Hordern, our colleague who is on the ground there right now, who was talking about how a lot of the officials there are bracing for a potential Trump administration and how the things that Joe Biden may promise this week aren't necessarily going to be held up on the other end if Donald Trump Uh, becomes the one to hold the Oval Office. How concerned should our allies be about that prospect? 
Well, I think it signals to us here at home, the fact that people around the world are concerned about our elections is just another reminder about where we stand. You know, people watch everything that we do. We are, you know, America is is focused on, uh, unlike any place else in the world. And our politics are, you know, the world's politics, essentially. And so it really does matter when we talk about where we stand with our allies and our role and an isolationist mentality is not going to uh, behoove us as a nation, but it does not help the rest of the world. And, and it's important for us to uh, reaffirm our commitments. And I think with Donald Trump, uh, you know, he has been erratic, to say the least, about certain things when it comes to foreign policy. And and so, you know, I'll be interested to see what happens, you know, in a few weeks from now for the first presidential debate to see what kind of stance and posture he takes uh, when talking about foreign policy. But his boasting about relationships with tyrants and, uh, you know, the likes of Vladimir Putin does not really impress me, nor should it impress the American people. Pat, Friday will be two weeks since Joe Biden rolled out this ceasefire proposal that he indicated at the time was coming from Israel. Uh, it's still not in effect. We've seen a U.N. Security Council vote. Nothing seems to be pushing this to the level of a breakthrough here. How important is it for him to show progressive Democrats that he can close the deal on this, if not now at the G7? I mean, what's important is to be fighting, is to be showing that, you know, these are the most difficult politics that exist probably anywhere in the world, you know, Middle Eastern diplomacy. And we need a steady hand on the tiller, somebody who can deal with these extraordinarily delicate situations with, you know, high stakes at all times and land the plane. So it's mm -hmm. very important. But that said, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day and these politics are extraordinarily, extraordinarily Did he difficult. jump the gun? I don't think so. I yeah. think it's important to, you know, put pressure on Hamas, put pressure on Israel and, you know, keep everybody at the table. Our panel stays with us coming up. The House GOP voting to hold Attorney General Merrick Garland in contempt of Congress just a short time ago. Our panel will weigh in next on Ballots of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. On this vote, the yeas are 216, the nays are 207. The resolution is adopted. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. There you have it, that vote taking place. Less than an hour ago, U.S. House Republicans voting to hold Attorney General Merrick Garland in contempt. As we reassemble our panel, Pat Dennis is with us, president at American Bridge 21st Century, along with Maura Gillespie, the founder and principal at Blue Stack Strategies. All right, Pat, this probably isn't your favorite question here, but why not just release the recording? He's held in contempt for standing in the way of releasing an audio recording of Joe Biden's testimony to special counsel Robert Hur. They already got the transcript. What's the difference? Yeah, it's a little bit of like if you give a mouse a cookie, the yeah. children's book, uh, but in political form. So basically, <laughs> you know, you give them, they're not here to like run a, you know, a nonpartisan investigation. They're here because Donald Trump asked them to impeach the president. That stalled out. It fell apart. Mm -hmm. And now they are looking for a consolation prize. If you give, give them the transcripts, you know, they'll say, oh, give me the audio. Give them the audio. Say, give me the video. Mm. Give them the video. Maybe they want to, <laughs> you know, biometric information or something. Ultimately, this is not about getting to the facts. It's about, you know, they hope they can go through the audio and find him stuttering or something. Like, it's a political maneuver and this is what they're trying to deliver to the American people when, like, people are interested in health care, they're interested in, you know, inflation. I think it's a bad look for the Republicans. But on bad looks, does this, could you not understand how this gives the perception that the president has something to hide? I mean, that's what they're hoping, but ultimately, I ask a single American off the street what this is about, what they're talking about, and you know, if they've been following the story at all, they know that Joe Biden was, uh, you know, had this uh, classified information. He found it. He immediately cooperated with uh, the Department of Justice. And that was it. Meanwhile, Donald Trump hid the records. The government had to physically go to his house, take the records away. They then found more later. So folks who are in the weeds on this are uh, not really on uh, Donald Trump's side. Well, we heard just yesterday from the Department of Justice special counsel, uh, David Weiss had this to say uh, to Attorney General Merrick Garland. Finally, I want to thank Attorney General Garland for providing the support necessary to fulfill our mission, ensuring that we have the independence to appropriately pursue our investigations and prosecutions. 
That was in the wake of the Hunter Biden uh, guilty verdict, Mora. Uh, should we be thanking that or holding in contempt the attorney general? They're separate issues, quite frankly. And I think, again, regardless of how you view this or how you see this move by Congress uh, to hold him in contempt of, of Congress, the fact remains that he ignored a subpoena. I believe he ignored two. So, again, you know, hmm. from a outside looking in perspective, that's what happened. That's just the facts. And doing so allows Congress to vote you in contempt. So, uh, you know, I think that separately, you know, again, we already have the transcript, so it does just seem to be uh, not wanting to give in to uh, Congress. And I think that that comes across as I know better than you type of uh, mentality. And that doesn't sit well with folks. And I think, again, looking at this from a step back, yes, do I think it's going to play a role in the 2024 election? No, I do not. But we've gotten to a point now in politics where everything that you do is viewed through a pro political lens, uh, for, for honestly, for worse, because I don't believe that's how our Constitution uh, was designed to set up our institutions, was not to view it so that everyone would be in trouble for taking a right step instead of a left step. You know, I think that we've gotten so uh, in the weeds on everything mm -hmm. that we've now scared people from wanting to be in public office. Uh, I don't know that this would really, if anything, this is going to encourage people not to run or not to hold public service uh, positions. And, and that, to me, is a, a huge disappointment. That's that's probably the biggest um, frustration for me to watch this unfold, because it is just playing mm -hmm. uh, tip for tap for Americans to watch and see uh, who's going after who this week. Um, but the, the facts remain that he did ignore a subpoena, so uh, he was held in contempt. All right, well, that's what happened in Congress today. What's happening in Congress tomorrow is Donald Trump is meeting with Republicans in both the House and the Senate. And we had some reaction to that news from Congressman Pete Aguilar, the Democrat from California, earlier today. This is just another you know, example of uh, House Republicans uh, bending the knee to, to Donald Trump. Um, he uh, wants them to impeach Joe Biden. They failed at that. Uh, now they're moving on to uh, uh, to Merrick Garland. Um, you know, censures, impeachments. I mean, that's just how dysfunctional the House Republican conference is. Maura, what is tomorrow's meeting really about for both congressional Republicans and for Donald Trump? Donald Trump is still looking for a vice president and he is still preparing uh, for debates coming up. So I, you know, uh, you, you both know this. I am no fan of, of Donald Trump uh, as a former president. I'm not uh, looking forward to the 2024 election between these uh, octogenarian choices. But I don't think that this is as newsy as, you know, Congressman Aguilar is making it out to be some sort of plot twist sort of thing. I think that, you know, as a candidate leading the Republican Party, uh, you know, does this have to happen on Capitol Hill? Probably not. They could have gone down anywhere else and had this conversation. Uh, but it's not completely abnormal to want to know kind of what the legislative outlook is for the next year, should he win, uh, kind of getting a plan together so that they can come up with uh, policies that are, on, you know, doable, viable, but also uh, benefit the American people and something that he can run with and run on. But again, I think the other factor there is the vice president pick. He still hasn't decided. And this could give him an opportunity to to get a better sense of how things are going in Congress. Hmm. Well, Patty's also got a, an important stop speaking to the business roundtable, and he's not going to be the only one there holding forth with Larry Kudlow, we understand. Uh, White House Chief of Staff Jeff Zients is going to be there, too, speaking on behalf of Joe Biden while he's at the G7. Mm. What is the counter message to whatever Donald Trump's about to say to this group of CEOs? And it's impossible to know what Donald Trump is going to say. Uh, what you've seen lately that's really been interesting to me is he's been willing to go into different groups of people and utterly pander to, like, a disturbing extent. He's, you know, been willing to go to the oil CEOs and say, you know, I'll repeal Biden's pollution regulations in exchange for a billion dollars in donations. He's been, uh, you know, going to the club for growth and saying, you know, maybe we need to cut entitlements. So, uh, you know, he's kind of off the chain. He's willing to say whatever it takes. He <laughs> needs the money. Uh, so you need to react in real time is what it sounds but, like. But, you know, Biden's focused on governing the country, which is a much more serious group of issues. And I think we'll see a lot more substance. Hmm. All right. Pat Dennis and Maura Gillespie, our wonderful political panel this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. The pre former president, Joe, going to be crisscrossing Washington yeah. basically all day tomorrow. House in the morning, business roundtable, then the Senate. Indeed. And so you're going up there. I will be. Early edition of Balance of Power. <laughs> Kaylee lines up on Capitol Hill. I'll be here with my eyes on the clock, and we'll see what we <laughs> learn by the end of the day. Indeed. And of course, for everything we learned every day, check out the Washington Edition newsletter on the terminal and online. 
Thanks for being with us, and thanks again to our panel. On Balance of Power, we'll see you back here tomorrow on Bloomberg TV and Radio.